Hi there and welcome. So my name is Stefan and right now we're going to talk about the big five, which is also referred to ocean or the five factor analysis model. And this model is my favorite model for personality because uh, simply it does something that no other model does and it gives you predictive power. In other words, once you really get to know these traits, you can start to see them in yourself and you can start to see them in other people and you can predict how they'll behave in different types of situations. So in this video, I'm going to go over the uh, five factor analysis, the big five, what the, the two master traits are, the five sub traits, which are also called the big five. Also, we're also going to talk about the 10 sub traits. So each of these big five is also subdivided into two other traits. And this is thanks to Jordan Peterson, who came up with the research. So uh, a little overview on the big five before we jump in. And the goal here is to really give you an understanding. And then by the end of the video and where you end up on the big five and then also how other people in your life where they are in terms of the big five so so the best way to think about these traits is to think of them as strategies in solving problems in the real world and we live in a three-dimensional space where our eyes are in front and we're constantly looking forward and we're looking to move towards and away from things so as we move towards things, we have a lot of information in front of us. We have billions of pieces of data. And what these traits do is they allow us to filter the world and to decide what's important, what's valuable, and to move towards it or to move away from it. And this is where we get our first two uh, master traits. And the two master traits are extroversion and then also neuroticism. And essentially, the best way to think of these two master traits is fear and desire so a lot of us are more motivated by desire and so we move towards things that we want to have in our life in order to, to be happy essentially to fulfill our needs right and when every time we do this what our brain does is it rewards us through dopamine it gives us a dopamine hit so people that are uh, either extroverted high in openness their brain is wired in a certain way where they get a dopamine hit when they engage in these activities now, people that are low in openness and extroversion don't get the dopamine hit. So instead, those same sort of behaviors and traits are taxing. They take a lot of energy and they don't give the benefit. Now, on the other side is neuroticism. You can call it uh, the propensity to move away from things. Those behaviors also get rewarded in the brain. And so at the end of the day, what this means is that not only are they strategies, but they also become hardwired strategies and they also become a way for us to filter the world. So here are the five uh, master traits. Um, so the first one is extroversion. And um, the best way to think about extroversion is that it's people that have uh, very positive emotions that are assertive and they like to move towards their goals. They feel like if they get their desires met, that they'll be happy or they'll have their needs met. So um, it's very, very ruled by the do dopamine cycle. So every time someone engages in extroverted behavior, and we'll go over all the traits there, um, they get rewarded by their brain. Uh, the next one is openness. Now, what is openness? It's this deep motivation uh, to explore the unknown. And the best way to explore the unknown is to explore ideas, uh, to explore abstractions, or to literally go into areas that are unknown. And in survival, that's very valuable. So imagine that, you know, you're in a hunter-getter society. Going outside the village has tremendous value because you can find out um, all kinds of things. You can find out uh, new technologies. You can find out uh, how other tribes are doing things. You can find out a new plot of land. You can find an area where animals are grazing. Um, you can find all kinds of goodies. On the flip side, <laughs> it's also very dangerous to go out. Right. So anytime you leave the tribe, there's an inherent risk because there's, you know, animals lurking in the bush. So um, this is where neuroticism comes up. And, some, and people that are high in neuroticism, their primary motivation is to avoid any type of threat. So there's this kind of uh, very natural push and pull where going out into the unknown and exploring what we what we're yet to find out. We might find out that, you know, you're at the edge of a cliff and you fall off and that represents a certain type of danger. At the same time, it also represents uh, something that far, goes far deeper because you might unpack something that's going to, you know, totally transform your society. And, and, and navigating those two things is very important. So 
the, the people that are high in openness are always trying to unpack new boxes and people that are high in neuroticism are, are a little concerned about opening up new boxes because you don't know what you're going to get. Um, the next trait is conscientiousness. And um, the best way to think about conscientiousness is uh, to think about uh, the primary motivation, which is someone, someone's feeling of duty, this duty to contribute. And there's almost a sense of guilt about it. Like you owe the group, the society, your contribution, so you work as hard as you can. Um, you're as orderly and as focused and as industrious as you possibly can be, so you could be as great a benefit uh, to the tribe. And uh, last but not least is agreeableness. And um, agreeableness is probably the one um, that is most associated with the maternal instinct. Right? So if you think about our hunter-gatherer example, um, you know, what are the different traits that are really useful in making sure that this group survives for the long term? Well, on one end, you need to have someone really take care of the infants um, and the elderly. And so the agreeable, uh, the people that are most agreeable are the ones that are going to take on that task. They're the ones that are going to be the most empathetic and compassionate and try to understand. They're going to be the glue of the group and you really need a, a, a glue to the group you need some sort of cohesion in order in order to be able to move forward as a group now the opposite side of agreeableness is competition so if someone is highly competitive this competition could fall into two different there's two different ways competition happens one is a competition with other members of the group uh, and it could be you know so you can get you know a, a better mate for example or it could be competition for the sake of the group with other groups. So um, both of those things really need to be kind of understood because competition within the group has its benefits, but also competition with other groups also has its benefits. And at the same time, you don't want to do that at the cost of, uh, of, of the group falling apart. If everyone's just competing and no one cares about the collective, then eventually the group falls apart. So this is where agreeableness and people with high compassionate empathy play a very, very important role in this society. So now let's jump in um, to each of these and unpack them a little bit further. And then as we go forward, I'll show some examples so you can see um, exactly how these would manifest in different settings. Uh, we'll try to make a couple of stories and then hopefully uh, you'll, be, you'll be able to identify them either at work, uh, at school, with your friends, family members, or just people that you meet for the very first time. And as soon as you know uh, which kind of uh, trait someone uh, comes from the most, it's going to really help you understand them better and communicate with them better. And there's a good reason for that. And that's because what happens is as we're navigating through the world, all of us have these five traits. And uh, these five traits aren't either like an on or an off switch. They're more like a gradient, right? And so... Um, we're, the thing is that the trait that we're the highest in is the, is, the, is the one that we're going to pull the most on. And that's the thing that we're going to be using the most often to solve our problems. So um, not only is it, the thing, is it the thing in our toolkit that we're using most often, it's also the thing that filters our world. So we literally see the world uh, through this trait or through this value or the, this value system. So as we look out into the world, we're going to filter out the things that don't align with it and then focus on the things that do and move towards that direction. So the two things that are important here is that uh, since that the, that's the case, it's important to know what trait you're the highest in and to know that you operate primarily from that trait or you, that's your first order in your hierarchy and then also to notice that in other people. And then you'll know where conflicts arise. You can also then see how conflicts arise within you personally because you might have certain traits that are, you know, <laughs> they don't work together well. For example, let's say if you're high in openness and high in conscientious and high in neuroticism, uh, for, you know, you have a lot of internal conflicts if, you have, if you're high in all those three areas, uh, for instance. Um, but also you, you'll learn how to talk to, with people better. So let's, uh, let's jump into extroversion. So extroversion really boils down to two uh, main categories. And, and the first is assertive and then the second is enthusiasm. So the best way to think about enthusiasm is uh, people that are very gregarious and friendly, people that are talkative, um, people that like to have fun and laugh. 
You know, these people make friends very, very easily. So if you're high in enthusiasm, you're also going to have uh, a very jovial personality. You're going to enjoy life. You're going to be in a, in a, in a positive emotional state. And the value here is that when someone is in a positive emotional state, and, and research has bared this out, not only, not only are you more likely um, uh, to succeed and find your goals and accomplish them, uh, but you're also smarter. You're, you're using more of your brain, for example. So uh, there's a lot of benefits to having a positive state. Also, you're gonna use people to solve problems. You're gonna solve problems by you know, talking to John, or Bob, or Mary, or, or Jane, the people in your circle. That's gonna be one of your primary ways of problem solving. Uh, the second part of extroversion um, is assertiveness. So assertiveness is people that are very, very good at being goal-oriented, they're natural leaders, um, and then they have a very, very well-known direction they wanna go and they go down it. Um, We've all met people that are very assertive, you know, type A personalities. They just go for it. And that's the second part of extroversion. Um, the thing about extroverts is that extroverts are going to have uh, these two facets. One is they're going to be goal oriented and they're going to try to achieve um, happiness or whatever that they're really looking for underneath it all, right? Happiness or security or, you know, through goals and through stories. So, if you're talking to an extrovert, if you talk about their goals and you tell them a story about it, that's really going to tie the two and it's going to help them uh, move forward with you. So the next one uh, is openness. And this trait is the trait that's mostly correlated with IQ, creativity and intelligence. And um, the best way to think about openness is people that want to go into uncharted territory. They want to discover the unknown. They want to do what hasn't been done before. Uh, th this is the, the trade that's pushing the world forward, creating technologies, creating new companies, creating arts, creating music, and so on. And, and, and there's two different types of openness. There's two subcategories. And, and one of them is the, on the intellectual side. And um, you know, good examples of, of this would be like uh, philosophers, psychologists, professors, people that are really, really into the intellectual uh, part of life. Uh, they like to explore ideas. They're very reflective. They like abs abstractions and they handle complexity very, very well. They're very, very curious and very imaginative. So these sort of people are, are very prone to daydreaming. They might close their eyes. They might be walking with their, their head down even and they might be somewhere else completely thinking about, uh, you know, black holes, for example. Um, on the other side of of uh, openness is aesthetics so um, and creativity. And this falls into any sort of creative domain, whether it's theater, the arts, uh, music. Uh, these are people that really, really enjoy uh, beauty. Um, and uh, and they, need to, they need to have a creative input. They need to come from this place of creativity. And if you think about any any of these creative geniuses, whether regardless of what area they're in, to some degree what they're really doing is they're, they're being very, very reflective. They're going deep inside themselves in a place and from this substrate, this unconscious layer, they're pulling out their inspiration and they're bringing into the, into the collective consciousness and sharing it with all of us. So that's one way to think about openness and that's kind of like really deep. I'll probably go over that in some other video, but. Um, next is neuroticism. So neurotics, neuroticism has two uh, subcategories. So one is withdrawal and the other is volatility. Now the volatility is really easy to notice. Does the person get upset easily? Do they get angry easily? Are they moody? Do they lose control? Um, are, do they overreact? Are they highly reactive? So whenever you see volatility, um, they, you know, the person's high in neuroticism. The other ver variation is that instead of blowing up, they withdraw. So an example of this would be someone that's very, very shy, okay? They're shy because they're having a lot of negative emotions and negative feelings about uh, what my other, someone else might think of, it, of them and so on. And so uh, they're very self-conscientious. Uh, they focus on their self-fault and the areas of their life where they're lacking. Um, 
They're very prone to feeling blue or feeling depressed. Uh, they get discouraged easily uh, and, they, and they're prone to freezing. So when confronted with a, with a situation, uh, the typical response is either uh, freezing, fighting, or, or, or flight, right? Freeze, fight, flight. And usually freeze is the most common, flight is the second most common, and fight is the least common. Um, so uh, people that are high neuroticism are more, most likely to freeze uh, and just you know, stay there. And freezing generally is actually you know, in nature a good response because if you're in the wilderness and, and there's you know, a, a, you know, a tiger that's approaching you, you, know, you can't outrun it and you're not going to beat it, beat it in a fight. But if you freeze, you can hope that it doesn't really notice you. So uh, next is conscientiousness. And conscientiousness, uh, out of all the traits, is probably the hardest to really pin down and, and understand on a deeper level. And the reason is, um, is because it's the least well understood. Uh, it's also really hard for us to self-evaluate how conscientious we are uh, because it's hard to know how conscientious other people are. So uh, conscientiousness uh, falls into two major categories. And one is orderliness. And the second is industrious. So people who are industrious are people who are very focused. They're great at planning. They get things done. Um, and, you know, they have a strong uh, sense of perseverance. They have a lot of what people call grit. On the other side is orderliness. These are people that are very tidy and neat. Um, they like routines. They like schedules. They like to plan their week. Um, they focus, um, they have a strong sense of duty to contribute. They have almost have a guilt about it, right? Um, and, they, and they focus on what has worked and continuing to focus on, uh, on that. So out of all the types, the conscientious people are the best at taking a good plan and executing it. And sometimes uh, the problem is, is they do such a good job of taking a plan and executing it that if the plan is bad, then they're going to execute a poor plan well. And that's maybe the last thing you want <laughs> is because then you end up going in the wrong direction two or three times as fast. So the, the, the downside of high conscientiousness is that you kind of miss the, you know, the forest for the trees. You end up going with a method that's tried and true. However, your environment has changed. Now you're in a different environment, but you're still using the old strategy. And you're going down the wrong path very, very quickly. Um, and next is agreeableness. Now, agreeableness is, uh, you know, empathy and compassion um, versus uh, competition is one way to look at it. Uh, but there's two substrates to agreeableness. And one of them is compassion, and the other one is politeness. So uh, with politeness, uh, you know, polite people respect authority. They're, they're very conflict, conflict avoidance. Um, and uh, they don't like to take advantage of people. Right, um, they're one of the other things that they don't do is they don't feel comfortable with swearing. So, like if you're to say a four letter word, uh, some of the time politeness will be turned off by it. Um, next, uh, and, and the other side of agreeableness is compassion. So, uh, with compassion, uh, basically, to what extent do, do you care or does the person care about other people's feelings and their problems, uh, and how engaged are you with that? So uh, people that are high in compassion are highly empathetic. Uh, they have a soft side. Um, they like to argue from the other person's point of view. Um, they'll even negotiate on another person's behalf. And the agreeableness really kind of lines up with the maternal care that I mentioned. One of the big differences between someone that's high in agreeableness and an extrovert is that someone that's high in agreeableness actually likes you. <laughs> Whereas the person that's high in extroversion likes being liked. So uh, even though sometimes that when you're out meeting with people, uh, those two things might overlap. So now let's, let's, uh, let's go over some scenarios and um, how you might notice what type of personality a person has. So for example, let's imagine that you're at work uh, and your boss uh, gives you a project and you have five, uh, a group of six people, there's five other people on your team uh, that are part of that project. So, just imagine that he wants you to uncover uh, an unknown island in the Pacific and to find out, you know, uh, how it could be monetized. How would each different personality type respond to it, right? So someone that's very extroverted, what would the extrovert do? 
someone that's enthusiastic and assertive, they might go and they might talk to all their colleagues and find out do you know, you know, whereabouts in the Pacific Ocean there's a lot of islands that haven't been explored yet? Uh, he's going to reach out uh, to his network and he's going to leverage people in order to get to that information as, much, as quickly as possible. Um, and then he's going to have a good uh, sense of, uh, or she, is going to have a good sense of leadership in terms of like, um, okay, this is our goal. We're, we're going to try to find an island. Maybe the island needs to be uh, near... Um, civilization to some degree maybe you want it to be near New Zealand and Australia and there's tons of islands that haven't been explored so probably there's a good place to look right so they're going to have a good uh, orientation and a good leadership in terms of and they're going to leverage people in order to get the information um, now someone that's high in openness how are they going to solve the problem well they're going to use their curiosity they're going to go and they're going to start researching about, you know, what parts of the world um, have the highest undiscoverable islands. W you know, where are these islands most beautiful? What are what are people researching online in terms of where they want to go? Um, they're going to use. Um, they're going to look for places that are naturally beautiful, um, that are going to attract people, uh, places that are inspiring. Um, someone that's uh, neurotic. Um, might want to avoid the project altogether. They might say, hey, this is not in my wheelhouse. I don't know how I feel about being on this project. Um, uh, they might get angry or upset that you put them on it. Um, and if, and in regards to the project itself, they might feel like, hey, we shouldn't be going down this path. This is, uh, you know, we're just wasting our time or something to that effect. Uh, someone that's conscientious is going to start um, planning and organizing the details of the project almost right away. Uh, they're going to ask themselves and, uh, and other people when they're available. Uh, they're gonna say, hey, this is what we need to do on first day, second day, third day. Uh, they're going to look at past projects and see if there's any other similar projects that they've done in the past and, and how they solved that problem. And they're gonna try to apply the same solution that they had before uh, to this project. Um, and someone that's agreeable, uh, is going to make themselves available and try to be as helpful as possible throughout the entire process. Uh, if someone asks him to research something or create something, uh, he's going to go and, and, and try to be as accommodating um, as possible. Um, he's going to go with the flow. He's not going to rock the boat. Uh, if someone comes up with a, with a very bad idea or, or, or let's say the group starts going in the wrong direction, one of the downsides of agreeableness is that the agreeable person might not speak up. So. I, th I hope that uh, example really helps solidify uh, th these traits and how they manifest in the world. So um, now <laughs> this is just scratching the surface. I'm going to do a lot more videos on this. If you like this, be sure to subscribe uh, and ring the bell. And then if you want to talk to me personally, you can email me below or you can text message me. And then last but not least, um, if you want to take the personality test um, or get access to some of the other content that I'm creating on this, there's a link below. Uh, let me know what you're most interested in and I'll send it to you. So um, if that's up your wheelhouse, be sure to check that out and I'll see you in the next video.